parameters, much things are very similar. So you don't do everything from scratch. Okay, so let's see, we, will, we are opening old project. Let me just, that I will get again new par, where is it? New par, I think it's this one. Yes, probably, yes. Okay, so now this was the whole project. Now I can replace spectrum. You select spectrum, I will try to fit the one that is already there. So the name of the spectrum you see at the top, 814005 and so on. So what is it? It's an alloy, it's naval brass. It's NIST standard, we are using it quite often. Uh, it's well characterized alloy. Main constituents are copper and zinc. And then you have some other, a bit of iron, a bit of tin in it. If you measure long enough, you get also those uh, elements in. If, if we will see this spectra where statistics is not good enough, so you don't see much other constituents, but it's very good uh, testing item. Alloys are nice because you don't see invisible components in them and makes you a bit easier life. If that would be some oxide or steel has carbon inside, these are invisible components in your alloy, make, makes life a bit more complicated. You measure, we, we actually, actually measure this in every cycle of pixel, even before and after. Because we, we do sort of quality assurance that some detector does not skip somewhere or something like this. Okay, so now we have uploaded spectrum. And now, for example, the next step is if you, don't, if you didn't do it yet, you can go and make energy calibration. Let's try. What we see here, I will first try to zoom a bit. You can zoom, okay, so that we will see. I think that's, that's the guessing, you must guess. The biggest line here, which is a bit lower energy than the second one, this would be copper, and this would be zinc K alpha. And I know that uh, copper K alpha is at 8.04 keV. So I begin with calibration. Hopefully I will do it reasonably. Let's click it. And I put here 8.04 energy in keV. Okay, and then you see it here. We see it, human brain see it. That's tin. You see, tin K alpha. I'm afraid that uh, for Gupix it will not be enough statistics, but we can use it at least as a calibration point. This is now, uh, I have some 25.27. These are the values taken from the file I was struggling before to show you. You have it online. Okay, now the calibration is done. Now comes a pain. In Gupix, you must go through all these steps. First, you should define whether it's a trace element solution in a no matrix. We are using this, for example, you have a, a, a plant material homogenized matrix is celluloses, and you're looking for PPMs of zinc in it, for example. That's trace element in known matrix. Here, we don't know anything. We just know it's alloy. And uh, we, we, we need to do that iteration I was also mentioning at the beginning of my talk. Computer needs to assume matrix, me, uh, me, uh, calculate concentration, and then correct the matrix and do again. And once it converges, it will stop automatically. Okay, so iterative matrix solution. Setup. We, we measure this at 45 degrees. Protons 3.03 MeV. This is the charge. I will show you next 
lecture how we measure the charge on a microprobe. So we know the charge quite well. And then we need to select the detector. As I mentioned to you, somebody should already describe the detector in your lab for you, or you did it by yourself. It will take you quite some time. Measure all the thin standards. So this is the description. That's how you describe one detector after another, several of them in, in each lab. And usually, we like to have them in hand for all the detectors. See, there are many of them. Silly, even SDD that I was showing you on a picture. So for us, this was EGA detector. OK, it's already there. Everything is there in description. So now we go sample. Sample structure, I mentioned to you, you can have thin samples in PIXE, no stopping, no absorption, easy life. You can have thick samples, a lot of integration for a software, and you can have even more complicated, intermediate thickness, where you need to do that integration from one energy to another. In our case, it's easy life, it's a thick target. You click their tick target. Oh, where is now? Just a moment. Oh, I have Houston. We have a problem. I cannot reach OK button. Yes. <laughs> okay. So. Now we will say, you see trace element solution is blank. I couldn't access because I said it's iterative. But I can define fit elements for iterative solution. And I add. We know it's brass, copper, zinc. They mentioned that there may be some iron in it. There is probably some tin in it. Whatever, I can do a bit more than required. It's not a problem. They will show me that there is no, I don't say, let's say, no titanium in it. OK, that's roughly, and let's try if he, he's able to fit with this set of peaks. OK, and you see here at the bottom, this is uh, to spoil somebody. Normalized concentration to 100% total. If you use this, it's just a sign that you don't know how to integrate the charge, how to measure number of primary protons on your sample. If you're using this option, I know many people do for alloys, that simply me means that they don't measure the proton current. For alloys where you see everything in it, it works, like this naval brass, for first stainless steel, they will be providing you wrong answers. So it's a matter of pride, the professional pride, to measure the current on your sample. Uh, I, I don't get that, because uh, what's the problem? If, uh, there is a lot of uh, electrons in the ratio between the peaks is why do you not, uh, For example, stainless steel, let's say it has 7% of carbon in it. Oh, okay, okay, because you have invisible... You will not see it. Okay. So you will uh, provide completely wrong numbers because you will have, you will see, say, okay, I have just iron and some nickel and some manganese in it, and you will give a wrong answer to your user. If you will measure the current, you will, you will see that you don't see something in this sample. You will have a deficit of 7 mass percent, and you know, it's an invisible component in stainless steel is, for example, carbon. And you will provide them good answer. That's a big difference. OK. So in brass, there is no invisible elements here. I don't need to guess anything. And now let us pre let's do some spectrum details. You see, I, say I have already calibrated a scale. I see it in key V. I can also see it in channel numbers. And I don't want to uh, fit here at the edge where, where this our absorber kills the low energy part. And we don't need to fit up here because there's nothing. So I would say between 
200 and 1200. Let's see now. Fit spectrum details, and we can see from 200, oh, let's say 1200. Okay, calibration we already calibrated, so uh, Gupix already calibrated our detector. We did it at the beginning. Then these are just default uh, values, how much pileups he will filter and so, uh, he will uh, take into account and so on. That's uh, already there usually. And you say just okay. And now with a bit of luck, we will be able to run. See, now iteration after iteration. Let's see what we got here. Residual, do you like it or not? What's wrong? Immediately you see, I like that most of the time I have very low residual, but here something's wrong. I screw it up. What's, what's going on? I mentioned to you, IGLE detector from Ortec or that we are uh, dealing with has nickel collimator. So instead of, you should not use entire crystal, but you need to reduce a bit the window because on the edges, resolution is degraded. So they put nickel collimator in it, and they didn't tell us. It took us a long time to figure out why our nickel results are usually wrong. Simply, if you have a lot of zinc, zinc photons have roughly 9 keV. When they hit the collimator, they fluorescent with nickel key alpha further down into the crystal. So you have artificial yield of nickel. Even nickel is not in your target, but there is, for example, zinc in your target. How you solve this in, how you solve this in Gupix? You say, do another fit. And now, description of the sample, we, de we define and we add additional element. And we say, yes, nickel. But I don't need PPMs of this bastard. This is parasite. And I tell him, I don't like him. It's a parasitic element there. So it will be fitted, but not taken into account in calculation of concentrations. Okay, okay, let's see if I didn't forget something, if I will be able to run again. Okay, is it much better now? Yeah. It is, yes. And let's see what is our, so this is what NIST, the data that they give you for this naval brass. These, these are mass persons. And let's see what we got. Let's see. We got 62% for copper, 38.9 for zinc. What, what you say, it's good or bad? If, huh? You don't like it. I'm not, why, how, you see, we didn't miss much. See, let's, let's see here the concentrations. Yeah, 62, 62% and 39%. 38.9. We see, have like 600, uh, half of the, uh, 600, a bit of iron, and we don't have enough statistics to see tin. That's, that's the story. With a bit of low statistics, you will not get much better precision with Pixie. But it's not too bad. Uh, if you are a chemist, you will say, ah, that's, that's crap. I push on a button, and it gives me result to the fourth digit. And you, you tell me that you are here up, you, you are missing here concentration by one person. That's crap. The problem is that they have no clue what their machine is doing and probably is doing 10% error. And they always do it the same way. And that's it. But here we control everything from the beginning to start and we end up with one person. And for me as a physicist, this is not a bad measuring result. 
you must be critical to the devices you are buying as a black boxes. Otherwise, you will sometimes do the errors they, others did it for you. So this is not a bad result for Pixie. I'm quite confident with it. If we miss one person, always I would jump to the, to the ceiling. Yeah. That's, that's my personal approach to this. OK. Gupix is a bit strange, as, as you saw, but that's probably the best we have for broad beam pixie at the moment in hands. And uh, it turned out that you can live with it uh, with a bit of uh, efforts. Okay. Another five minutes, and then we go very short through RBS. Yes, please, questions. Yeah. From the chronometer and the detector. Yes. What if you have some nickel in your sample? That's that's a problem. We have two detector pixie. We have also another detector there uh, for low energies, which also see that energy. And if you must be careful, if there is no zinc, for example, or something heavy, like I don't know, with 10, 11 keV or something in your. Eaglet will give you right number because there will be not enough energy to excite nickel in your sample. But if you have a lot of copper and zinc in it, you are on a bad track. You should use it as a parasitic and you will not evaluate nickel with this detector. Regarding the H index that is already there, it is calculated by the software, the H value for the H value is, I would say, when we were high school students, we were joking that when we were doing practical exercises, we got uh, good uh, exact results. For example, Millikan, Millikan, uh, Millikan uh, exercise, if you know, the, the, when you measure elemental charge. Some, some of my school friends got perfect results almost for Nobel Prize. And we were joking that they were using a constant that is not a constant, but it's a value of all the parameters in your experiment in order to give to yield the proper result. This is roughly uh, H value in Guppies is similar thing. If you don't go in detail with these thin films into your efficiency calibration, and you will take a standard like this, and you will get instead of 61, 54% of copper, you know you have a problem. But using that H value properly, you can bring it to proper value. So you solve it for copper. And then if you have enough standards, but not micrometer ones, you don't care much about efficiency, but you do H value, which is also energy dependent. And in the end, if you do a lot of standards, you may end up with similar precision as we did. That's why H is there because efficiency calibration is not always very successful. Or people don't take time. It, it's a lot of work. They take, uh, for example, uh, one of the glasses NIST standards that gives you 15 elements in one shot. And you simply forget about the efficiency of the detector. You can even click in Gupix that he will ignore efficiency. And he takes only H value as a function of energy. And your concentrations will be, again, correct. And you can do it in one shot. But if you have time, I would rather suggest to measure efficiency correctly. Uh, one question. Uh, is your chamber covered uh, in the inside by a low, by a light material to avoid the fluorescence of the, uh, from the iron? No, we have on microprobe, we have stainless steel. And that's why we need to play quite some times with additional plastic collimation to reduce the yield from the wall of the chamber. It's not so straightforward. So one thing you can do it that you sacrifice a bit of solid angle and recess a bit more your sensitive crystal, and then you see just really limited part of your chamber. It's, it's a problem, yes. Always if you have stainless steel chambers. Some another question? Yeah. As concerning the uh, again, usually don't, uh, it depends upon the 
matrix when you have to add the oxide value? Maybe you have some element that you have. Yeah, especially with glasses. With glasses, it's usually everything, for example, in glass is oxide. And uh, for me, that's, that glasses are quite, I never uh, worked with them, but I see colleagues, it's a big art to put proper oxide uh, inside that your concentrations fit. Actually, prob what I learned, everything in glass is in oxide form. And you need to tell Gupix that everything is in oxide, and then still uh, concentrations are uh, well cal calculated. It's fro I do much more trace element calculation for a plant or, or anim uh, animal biology. You know some matrices that are a good description, and you just work in a trace element, and this works quite, quite well. And quite insensitive. If you screw it up with a little, a bit of light element matrix, your result is in such constraints as we saw it. Matrix is, if everything is in of light elements, sometimes we, we say if you put mylar as a matrix or of cellulosis, doesn't matter. If you want 10% precision, you will be inside. Absorption is quite similar. Trace element levels in Pixie are anything, for example, for zinc, we can do 0 0.2 ppm in long run. Up to, up to concentrations that are 0.1%, you can still consider everything as a trace. For example, you, have, you, you buy a package of uh, wheat floor, flour, and uh, it's uh, inside, you know, it's some zinc, some iron in very low concentration that are typical traces. But they're very important for your diet. If you don't get that zinc and iron, you know, and that's where we are very strong with Pixie. If it's 200 ppms in uh, plant matrix, we can, we can measure it pretty well. Yes, please. Uh, uh, you, in, in synchrotron, you have a fluorescence, which is uh, in the best beam lines, you have better lateral resolution than we have. Uh, there, for example, you take 5 kV, 5 kV energy, and you can do fantastically everything below, let's say, 4.5 or something, below the edge. You, and you, but you don't get information, for example, on tin, on some copper, on zinc. So it's, uh, I would say we, we are still in job because we are easily accessible, much easier than the synchrotrons. We are much cheaper and uh, in some occasions not uh, worse than, than they. But uh, I agree, if, uh, for example, one good beam line on synchrotron costs about 10 million or even more. Our entire center, you will see tomorrow, there is about five or six million of equipment. So these are different proportions. They're just one beam line is much more worth than uh, if we work in accelerator centers than our accelerator centers. That's the reason. Okay. Okay, if not, let's do a quick tour on RBS for half an hour, I know that you heard about it. And I will, again, uh, Natko, yes. would you remind me 10 minutes to four to stop whatever I did to, to do one semen run together with, with you? Okay. Can I have your email address to send you this file right now? Can I okay. your email he, was in, he was in CC for the, in the email. Did you see CC? No, she was in CC. No, 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 no. Okay. okay. So you just replay it to all? Because I checked it online, I couldn't find it. It's broke for that. I went to his web page, but he's in lab this one. Let's do really experimental view on RBS.
Get to switch again. So you heard about Rutherford Beck scattering already. And uh, we will go fast through it, especially some considerations of, see that this guy will give us the, not yet. Okay. So I will just tell you just a few brief words, and then I will go to experimental setups. How you put together a reasonable, a reasonable system, data evaluation. We will try one example, and uh, that's it. As you know, this is, uh, RBS is like playing with balls. You throw something in a box of balls with different sizes and uh, another ball, a small one, and you get a jump out. And based on the velocity of a recoiled ball, you can uh, somehow deduce what was in the box. That's roughly, roughly the, the case. So you are firing on your thin film sample or bulk sample or whatever with something light. In our case, we are using a lot of helium free because it's also, we get also an array signal. And also we did in the past a lot with lithium ions, but also with helium four. So these are typical projectiles for conventional rather for scattering. And then you put your detector on backscatter tangle with some slits to define well the, the space uh, solid angle. And uh, that's it. How to connect it and so on, I will show you a bit later. So you have a, a complementary method. You can take heavy particle and kick light elements out. You know that's elastic recall detection. But we will limit to RBS. OK, so standard RBS. We detect scattered ions with silicon detectors. What kind of detectors? I, will, I have something with me. I'll try to not really open it. They're old and used. Mm -hmm. And show, uh, uh, take them out, please, and show to the people. OK, surface barrier detectors, where uh, in the past, when I did my diploma work, I used surface barrier detector. It's st they're still in use and in sale. Only I remember that putting it into operation was huge stress. You touch it, you kill it, like beryllium window on X-ray detector. Very difficult to wash. Once you touch with a finger, forget, throw it away, it will never work again. Ion implanted detectors that are we using uh, the silver one that is, goes around, they are quite resistant, you can even wash in isopropyl alcohol and you will recover all the properties. So for the energy resolution, full width of half maximum of americium alpha source, the line has 5.8 MeV. So, so easy. You can buy very weak alpha source, americium, very thin. So, and then you just put it in and measure what, what's the performance of your detector. As I mentioned to you, surface uh, barrier detectors were very scratch sensitive. The, actually, these silicon detectors are like ionization chambers. What you have a part of the space volume where you don't, when the ionization particle enters this volume, you need to take care that recombination, once the uh, free carriers of charge are formed, you should prevent against recombination. And you can do it in various ways. On, you know, on ionization chamber, you usually put electric field that pulls charge particles to the electrodes. Here, it's, sim it's simply very, very similar. In the case of uh, surface barrier detector, your Schottky contact between metal and silicon 
does electrical field and pushes the carriers to the contacts. And if in the last time implanted detectors, you do similar thing, but you implant ions and you form so-called uh, this transition layer that uh, collects, it pushes the charges to your collection electrodes. You see, this is again, this is from Leo, a book, old book that I recommend all if you find it in some antique store, keep it on your shelf because a lot of things are still completely the same today as they used to be in my student times. So you see this is when you put into contact metal and semiconductor, you got so-called Schott Schottky contact, and this is the electrical field inside depletion, we call it depletion layer. And if you go with the charged particle through it, here no charge will remain here, but they will be simply uh, one side, uh, one charge will go to one side, one and another, and you, you record on the contacts a pulse. That's how are, they are encapsulated at the end. This is Ortec drawing, and you can see them, they are, they are going around, how they look like. Okay, that's an old, Question. yeah. Excuse me, yeah. you didn't mention, uh, maybe intentionally, maybe a little later, the dead layers of these two different detectors. Yes. Sorry. Uh, they are typically, I don't know, maybe the contact is 10 nanometer, gold one on surface barrier detector. I'm guessing something like this. And uh, probably that layer on surface barrier is slightly bigger than on implanted on one. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so if you go to old Ortec catalog, that how they describe how you connect. So first you need to put their preamp and you plug to the preamp by a supply and then you go through analog spectroscopy amplifier and then multi-channel analyzer. Today, we still use this approach, but we have one shortcut. You can take the cable from here and go directly to digital pulse processor. That's in the recent times uh, much more common. And good practice rules. If you want to get really good RB resolution in RBS, please, uh, when you will put things together, try to remember. Connection detector preamplifier as short as possible. When you, once you go, for example, from chamber, if you have preamp on the air side, how you will do the connection? I, I'm sending you several fit throughs here. Go, let, and please think which one would fulfill the, the request that I told you the best out of those four. So what is there? Coaxial cable that connects detector and your preamp has a, a, a property that it's called impedance. And you should not interrupt it on this way. What is interruption? For example, you go just with a normal wire from your detector to the uh, inner, uh, inner vacuum electrical fit through. It's uncontrolled impedance on that port. You will uh, catch a lot of noise on that, that road. So the best is you put coaxial cable of this type on your detector. And this is already 50 ohm impedance. And then you have coaxial connector on the vacuum side and then connect to one of those flanges, and you have again coaxial connector on the other side. So you don't interrupt this 50 ohm logic. This is also a cable, please pass around. That's also important. And this is another thing. The same holds for pixel detector. Your vacuum chambers are actually big chunks of metal. And your, your shield on the coaxial cables, when you bring it out of the chamber, should not come into contact with it. So one of the, one of the flanges there 
fulfills this requirement, please think which one is the best out of those four. That's a task for you. So don't come into contact with your chamber at all. The earth definition of your detector should be done by your, either by your digital pulse processor or, or your spec amp, not by your chamber. Coaxial shield on coaxial cable should never come into contact with your chamber. Uh, if the cables from preamp to spectroscopy amplifier are quite long, try to use preamp with higher gain. Uh, historically, we were using, I will show you, uh, this normal preamp, this is Canberra model. You have also Ortec has equivalent. And their gains are actually quite low. And we were buying new detectors, but it was a big struggle to get like 11 keV then in RBS. In the last time, you see how, how we make it. This is the interruption between the earthing of the chamber and the earthing de defined by these shields of coaxial cables, even to the preamp, from the spec amp five meters away in your rack. As, as soon as we got some ohmic contacts here over, over, resolution goes from, I don't know, from 10 to 18 kilo electron volts. So it's, it's, it's a bet. Try to avoid it. Yeah, but the, the impedance there is not constant. Need not constant. For, this, is, this is not the best. I will show you even better solution. Here you have LEMO fit through, if you know this one. Yeah. But here you see there is a problem. You have conflict flange and you have a chamber there. We usually put Viton gasket. Viton gaskets are around, substitute for a copper gasket. They're also in one of these enclosures. And we insulate the screws. So the flange is on a potential of your preamp and digital pulse processor a long way. No contact with the chamber. And then this is inside. That's how it looks like. You have some holders for your detectors. They should not be in contact with you. You have them usually in some insulating uh, ceramic or plastic uh, enclosures. If you want to have good mass resolution, put your detector as close as 180 degrees. If possible, 170 is quite standard angle for many labs. And then, if you have this thin americium source, you measure this spectra. This is logarithmic scale. Actually, on linear, you see only one peak. And you check his full VTF half maximum. If it's 11, and Canberra tells you that it's 11, you did a good job. Uh, in our lab, this was a bit struggle. It's, it's, it's really difficult to put it in real conditions and have 11 keV until we didn't get in the lab first cool fat preamps from Amptec. Now this is quite standard. For example, this is now silicon edge. And you see both silicon isotopes here. And this, if you want to fit with semen array, it's better if you take 10 keV for the resolution than the specs 11. So if you do it well, you can sometimes even surpass the factory uh, given resolution because they always do it on a safe side. They put it a bit more, otherwise you would complain, I cannot gain it, get it from you. If, if you do RBS, of course, and if you do PIXA, I mentioned before, charge integral. Uh, measurement of incoming ion dose. You have several approaches. The easiest one many of us are using is you connect your sample through the charge integrator to the earth. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. OK, so if you want that this works, that secondary electrons wouldn't escape, please use some battery pack with voltages above at least 100 volts or more so that all secondary electrons would come back. You can insulate the entire chamber. Also works in some cases, but it's a big antenna. Our charge digitizer doesn't like it. Sometimes there's always some stray current measure. And then you have in-beam devices. When I was uh, your age, I, I, I got agent EIA practice in Rosendorf. In 95, all the chambers had 
choppers that I am using in my case as well in the labs. So I will show you. So they are insensitive, these in-beam devices, to, to secondary electron escape from the sample, type of the sample. They don't care if the, your sample is insulating or not. And I will show you two, two types. One is quite simple. You have two cylinders and you put inside a mesh. Here is a mesh. It's looking from a side with roughly four lines per <coughs> millimeter. And the beam is coming, like 20% of the beam end up on the mesh, and you put it to the charge integrator. Also on the mesh, you get secondary electron escape, and you put these two cylinders here on minus like 500 volts, and you have very stable in-beam charge integration. You don't care what's on your sample. You will always tell correctly how much beam goes through the, to, the, to your sample. And alternative, which we're using on microprobe, you rotate such chopper in your beam, and you then integrate the gold backscattered signal, gold peak in your EBS. OK. Now. So the first one is not appropriate for the microbeams? No, probe. just for broad beam. The chopper is appropriate for microprobe. OK. Now, when you do, when you start RBS, you, you must do an energy calibration based on what you get on the surface of your, or of your sample. So, because scattering, edge of your scattering box in your spectra is simply multiplication of uh, quantity called kinematic factor, just function of both masses and angle, and depends on initial energy. If you know initial energy, you know your element and the angle, you know what should be the energy there on the edge of the box. And then you take, for example, tantalum, rhodium, molybdenum, titel, silici, oxygen, and you check what were, the energy, what were the channels on the boxes, and you calculate what the energy should be there. If you did it correctly, usually calibrations are quite linear. In this case, you see it was energy you calculated as 11.5 keV per channel times the number of channel plus 21.8 keV. That's connected to the question of NATCO. What this offset here means, each detector has small dead layer. And thicker the dead layer, thicker this linear, uh, larger this linear offset is. <coughs> let's let's see the uh, one example is, for example, nitrite, tantalum nitrite. What you can do with RBS, you can estimate both thickness and stoichiometry of the film. This is the tantalum box, and here, here is the substrate. Front edge here indicates that you have tantalum there. If you check what is the energy here of these channels, you know that it's tantalum box. This, this box belongs to elemental tantalum, and if you have charge normalized measurements, if you have some nitrogen in your layer, this box is correspondingly lower. And now, depending on the thickness, these boxes can be wider or narrower. That's how you estimate then the, the, the thickness. OK, I will show you now a short example with semen array on these aluminum oxynitrite films. We did a long time ago with assistance of the agency in 2005. Let me see if we will manage to just okay so that's similar. 
Oh, shit. Let me try to. Just mirror the display. Don't double the display. Yes. Better? Yes. Thanks, Natko. OK. So this is Simon Ray, author is Matei Meyer from Garching. And once you upload the spectra, you can see here, you can use uh, read spectrum data, ASCII, just two, two columns, channel and yield, very simple. So once you upload the spectra, here you, you use the, its name, you go to setup and you say experiment. You select the ion, in our case what's lithium-7, and there, here is its energy, angles, and calibration. The calibration, I showed you how it's done just before. And then this detector resolution for lithium always worse than for helium. That's how the physics works. And that's most of it. You describe your, your experiment. And then you need to input the target. What, what was the structure there? On the top, they put gold. Then comes aluminum oxynitrate. We don't know this, how much any of those is. With ordinary RBS, it will be a big pain. We cannot separate whether it's oxygen atom or nitrogen atom. This is beyond the uh, ability. And then they put here a tantalum and then etched silicon. We can say that there is no much ox uh, oxide here, it's silicon. Now let's see what, what we can do with, with lithium with 4.2 MeV. Now I'm already putting the tentative answers for gold. The units are 10 to 15 atoms per square centimeter. You, can, you have somewhere up here tool to recalculate what is the thickness in nanometers for gold. Then comes aluminum oxynitrite. This is one of the gases. I put some for uh, nitrogen, roughly one, one, one. We will see how good description will be this for the first iteration. And then next, tantalum is there. And then next, with finite thickness, and then you put silicon with some great number. That means silicon substrate. Let's see the calculation. He will ask me for uh, cross sections. I say, take everything rather for it. For lithium seven. Yes. Yes. Isn't it a little bit too high energy? No, no, it's, 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 it's OK. OK, so I deliberately put here logarithmic scale. If we put here linear, doesn't look too bad, our first guess, you see. OK, what's, what's worrying is this, what are the hell are these boxes here? This box and this box. If you put logarithm axis, you can see it much more pronounced. Something's wrong. We, our task is to understand what was that. because they need to make these films, and the conditions are not, not, not always optimal. You see, they made it quite nice because we have two markers, before and after the layer. So roughly that distance between these two layers roughly indicates the thickness of the sample. And you see, this box roughly corresponds to this, and this strange box similarly. So there is something actually in this layer here in between. Let us guess what is there. We go to target. Sorry. 
we keep the golden layer as it is, and we will act. Uh, we will add two more elements in this box. Something is wrong in these layers. Now guesses. When you do thin films, what could be in? Iron. Huh? Iron. Let's try iron. Let's stay, tell the iron is for the maybe for the lower box, and what we will say for the higher box, something heavier. What would you say? Some guess doesn't matter. Nickel. Nick, nickel is almost iron. I would take something yeah. further up. <clears throat> I borrowed a periodic system from my daughter. <laughs> So, Natko said iron. Let's say the iron is for a lower box. Let's take something heavier, maybe some rhodium, palladium, or silver, maybe something, or ruten let's say ruthenium whatsoever. I don't know what did they have in this reactor, what happened, what's going on there. We will see what are our gases and we will put there not much these are impurities in the tin film let's say two percent two percent two atomic percent and now if i say okay he will complain semen ray is, is a picky guy he wants hundred percent you see so i will simply take a bit of oxygen away and now it should be okay and let's calculate again. So you, you expect it from, from the filament? Then it can be done. We will see. Yeah, okay. What was our guess? Hmm. The heavier is not heavy enough, the lighter is not light enough. Is it? Yeah. This box should be a bit more here, and this box should be more here. The heavy is tungsten, for sure. OK, let's try. <coughs> Let's try tungsten. Uh, I wouldn't say tungsten natco because you have a welly there in between. Gold. It's too close, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. if you agree. But let's try to see what's it. Something lighter than iron. How far down you would go. So iron is there. We go down the road. Where we will stop? Your guesses. Why don't you combine with Pixie so you know everything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where would you go? Titanium. Oh, scandium. Let's let's do scandium. Okay. So, so. No, 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 no. This was the too heavy one. This is the too heavy. Too heavy. Then let's go lower, huh, guys? No, no, no. You, 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 you didn't touch uh, iron that should be I, Sorry? Iron should be tungsten? No, no, I don't know. You no, it's it's not. You know where to let's go less than tungsten, OK. Let's go to uh, what? Uh, silver, for example, or? Ruthenium. Ruthenium, yes. Come on, ruthenium. Where from? Ruthenium. And here we said we will use titanium or what? No, for the lower one. Titanium. OK. Or scandium. Let's do scandium. What is SC? OK. And then we say calculate. Better guess, but still far away. Yeah. So let me let we, we don't have much time. So the guys who are operating these facilities usually use for for as a carrying gases. Guess what? Something that chemically does not argon. interact. Let's say argon for the uh, lighter one. So 
So instead of scandium, we say argon. And what we will use for the heavier one from the same class? Let's try xenon, yeah. You see, these are noble gases. Yeah. So for us all, I was so uh, shocked when one find, finds out that uh, noble gases are there, stable in the film. Yeah, this was the last guess. I would never see And now you can only play with a bit of concentrations and you will completely reconstruct. And the story is not over, but we will stop here. You see this peak here, and you see this peak here, again. And their separation, their peaks, and their separation is the width of the box. What would you say, what are those peaks? Surface. Surface and, so this and this. Obviously somebody was cheating with gold, it was not pure gold, and also tantalum was not completely pure. Turns out the best goes is silver, like 10% of silver in golden layer, and some strange thing I even don't remember in uh, next to tantal. Okay, that's how you iterate the height of the boxes you would do just by changing the concentration. I will, I will try to... Uh, show you the, maybe I have the, the last. Let's see if, if it's the correct one. Okay, roughly like this. Without surface, without, without these two peaks. Okay, that's, that's all of it. Sorry for taking you five minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some, uh, Just one question. Yes.